Thank you very much for joining today. Today we're going to discuss on one of the most confusing and controversial concepts about the conception of divinity within the Vedic context. That is the, the idea of there being many gods. And what does that mean practically for us when we are trying to understand the Gita and try to live its teachings. So I am sharing the screen. I hope it's visible enough. So it's a 26th session. So we are almost <clears throat> nearly half, past the halfway mark. And this is two subjects we'll discuss. Why should there be so many gods in the Indian tradition? Isn't one just one god enough? That as the Gita teach polytheism. So this is 721 in the Gita. Yo yo yam yam tanum bhakta shraddhaya harchitum ichchati tasya tasya chalam shraddham tameva vidhadham yaham. So as one yo yo yam yam tanum bhakta, as one desires to worship, tanu refers to form. Whichever form, whichever manifestation one desires to worship, shraddhaya architum ichchati, as one desires ichchati, with faith, shraddhaya architam is worship. Tasya tasya achalam shraddham. For them, chalam, chala is fickle. Chanchala was a characteristic use for the mind earlier. So achalam refers to unmoving. Tasya tasya achalam shraddham. Tameva vidadham yaham. I make their faith unshaking. I make their faith strong. That's what Krishna is saying over here. So uh, let's look at what this means. That means Krishna is himself behind the system of the worship of various gods. So this is three topics we'll discuss. Why are there so many gods? How they serve a common purpose? And how the system reflects Krishna's extraordinary compassion? So broadly, now this is a pendulum which will you can keep in mind throughout the class and um, this will be coming back to it in our discussions. So conventionally, the system of worship is thought in two terms, systems of worship. Broadly, there's monotheism, where there are theism is belief in God. Mono is one. So theism is monotheism is the idea that there's one God. Polytheism is the idea that there are many gods. And in between is the Vedic conception, which we could call as polymorphic monotheism. That means there is one God who manifests in many forms uh, and, and at many levels. Let's try to understand this further. So monotheism is the prominent understanding within the Abrahamic religions. The Abrahamic religions are Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. They often pride themselves on the fact that they worship one God, which is good. But they often look down at polytheism, which was what was present before, say, especially Christianity gained prominence in the, in the European world. So now all these religions, all three, three monotheistic religions originated in the Middle East, but they especially gained influence and prominence when they went and gained power in Europe, in Rome and other places. And from there, it spread across the world. So <clears throat> Jesus was crucified by Pompus Piliate, who was a Roman represent, representative of the Roman government there. But eventually those Rome, Romans themselves embraced Christianity several centuries later. And when they embraced it, they completely trashed the systems of worship that were existing previously. And those were the, that, that was considered to be polytheism. So the idea was, there are many gods and they are competing for turf. That there is a constant bat cos cosmic battle going on, not necessarily between the forces of good and evil, but even among the various gods as they try to gain control and supremacy. And when the, when the European colonists came to India, they thought, that they, because in India they saw many forms that being worshipped, they naturally concluded that this was also monotheistic. This was also polytheistic rather. And they minimized and trivialized it, saying that, uh, how can there be many gods? Now, now, the basic problem with polytheism is talked about in the Bhagavatam also, that if there are many gods, 
then when these gods uh, disagree or when they give different uh, different injunctions whose injunction is one to follow and that would lead to chaos in the cosmos so that is one of the major arguments against polytheism and if we understand that god is the creator then which god is the creator so poly so the vedic conception is not actually polymor polymorphism it's not polytheism it it actually doesn't fit into these two categories so it's polymorphic monotheism which refers to one divinity that manifests in many forms and in many levels so the vedic conception is of divinity is too subtle and too complex to fit into western categories so it's not that there are many gods but there's one god who manifests at many levels and in many forms through many persons so now when we say one god manifests at many levels does that mean that the gods are not real persons well, they are real persons persons to understand that let's see how they serve a common purpose <coughs> now moving forward with respect to this idea of conceptions of the divine the abrahamic conception holds that there is one true god and there are many false gods but the vedic conception is different in the sense that <coughs> there is one supreme god and many subordinate gods many subordinate gods what does that mean that means that there is a system of cooperation so if example there is a if we consider so in that sense it's not true god and false god so it's not that say indra chandra surya shiva these are not considered false gods we see in the abrahamic traditions right from judaism to islam whenever they would conquer any particular territory the first thing that the rulers would do is go and bash all the idols that were there when muhammad himself did that in when he conquered medina and it goes back to the old testament now jesus himself did not lead any campaigns he was not a warlord but many of the kings who are described in the old testament they are uh, they were uh, they would fight and when they would win a kingdom the destruction of the images that were being worshiped is described in a very celebratory and triumphal tone also a glorious thing to do so the idea over there was that that the false gods take away from the true god the worship that is meant for the true god and in that sense to the extent the false gods are downed the false gods are destroyed to that extent the one true god will be glorified and in fact it was considered that for the worship of the one true god the, all the false gods have to be rejected and <clears throat> even say for example in india uh, <clears throat> many mosques they were built by demolishing temples and not only were temples demolished but also often the sacred imagery from the temples was used to make the stones for the steps to the mosque and the idea was that we step on the false gods to go to the true god so this this kind of now this kind of intolerance in action is of course uh, done by some extremists but the intolerance in conception is not extremist it is mainstream to the abrahamic uh, abrahamic religions intolerance is considered to be by intolerance means that no other god should allow be allowed to be worshiped because they are false gods and false gods are competitors to the true god so this is critical to understand how how the vedic conception is very different the vedic conception is about is more like a cosmic cabinet ministry where there is one supreme god who is like the prime minister and there are many subordinate gods who are like the uh, who are like the cabinet ministers and they all have their portfolios now sometimes some of the gods may even have some fight over some small things just like even in the cabinet there can be some fights among uh, different uh, ministers but 
the entire cabinet is meant to serve the nation to protect the nation so the cabinet ministers may fight among each other but if say another enemy at if external enemy attacks and all of them will be united to fight the enemy so this is a fundamental difference between the true, between the true god false gods idea and the occasional conflict among the vedic gods and why i'm emphasizing this point is i'll we will talk about come back to this point in the conclusion but there is so within that there is intrinsic cooperation for cosmic administration and people's elevation so intrinsic cooperation so just like a cabinet ministry that is meant to be cooperation for what for administering the state so like that this is for administering the cosmos and for people's elevation so how does people's elevation happen i'll explain that briefly so as i mentioned one prime minister and many cabinet ministers and so one way in which this system of worship is talked about if for example the matsya puran is that there are 18 puranas and six of them recommend worship in goodness six of them recommend worship in passion six of them recommend worship in ignorance the worship in ignorance means people who are at particular levels of consciousness uh, they actually will be gravitating towards certain objects of worship naturally and uh, now this is just one typology to analyze it is not that absolutely everybody who is worshiping uh, uh, in passion will be worshiping brahma or worshiping those in ignorance all those who are worshiping shiva will be in ignorance but this is one sample of how the system of worships is to be understood that there is a progression so rather than going into the specifics over here we can't presume that everybody who worships shiva will be in ignorance nor can we presume that everybody who worships vishnu will naturally be in goodness but the principle is this is like a template or this is like a uh, this is like a one conceptual tool for understanding the idea of multiple levels of worship for people with different levels of consciousness so the, now i talk about how they serve a common purpose now how the system reflects krishna's extraordinary compassion this will going to be the th thrust of our class so i'll start with a story from the abrahamic traditions many of you know the story of the prodigal son the prodigal son story is that there was this wealthy lord who had a son who was often insubordinate and one day this son got fed up with this what he felt was his father's draconian control and he said i just want to leave leave you and i want to live my own life and for that purpose you give me my share of the inheritance and i'll go i'm going off so his father said no you can live with me whatever you want i will provide you but he said no just give me my share of inheritance and i'm going so then he left and he because he had money he got a lot of friends he squandered all the wealth on various pleasures and eventually he ended up with no money and as soon as he lost money he lost all his friends also so then um he started looking for some kind of employment he worked with a exploitative lord exploitative master who asked him to feed his pigs and then Uh, he could eat whatever remained after feeding the pigs that same food his prodigal son felt so miserable the word prodigal itself means wasteful so he felt that i have wasted my money and now i'm wasting my life over here and he remembered how even his his father treated even his servants better than the way he was being treated and finally he decided to go back home and when he went back home he was very apprehensive because he rejected his father squandered his father's wealth but when he came back he was welcomed his father uh, became delighted and celebrated his return <clears throat> well, that's the prodigal son story now we will extend that metaphor now this prodigal son story is actually talked about in the old testament it start talking the biblical literature and the idea is that how great is god's love that even if he reject we reject him he doesn't reject us he still accepts us back 
while that is true the vedic conception goes further and says that god doesn't just wait for us to return god works for us so that work so that we can return works means he makes various arrangements so one such arrangement that he makes is the system of the worship of the devtas so let's understand this we'll extend this metaphor so in this table on the left you see the object of service and the right is the purpose of service here we're talking about so on the left i'm talking about the prince that uh, say assuming this uh, if this lord this prodigal son who has left his father is a, is not just a, like a landlord but suppose he's a king so <clears throat> the metaphor itself is being talked in the in outside the braces and what the metaphor employs is talked about in the brackets so if we move forward here what's happening let's look at the fourth level and from there we'll move to the first level so the prodigal son is serving some exploitative masters and getting some exploitative rulers and getting some money out of it getting able to survive that is like people in the world we all serve various masters everybody is serving in some way or the other so that they can get something so that they can fulfill their desires or they can at least get their fulfill their needs so that's worshiping for money and material benefits or the next is the king's ministers so the now the king thinks that here my son is there and he is uh, he is not ready to come back home but the father the father here in the say the king comes to know that his son is suffering so he knows that if he himself approaches currently there is a estrangement there is a alienation between the father and the son and if the father himself goes the son may not come back so the father decides to send his representative so this representative goes to the son and he says hey you are working here uh, how much are they paying you and how are the conditions he comes to hear about it he says you come to me i'll give you something better and he agrees and that's how now the see imagine if the father was the king and the son had left the kingdom to go somewhere else now when the king's minister approaches the son and invites him to come back the son has at least come back into the father's kingdom although he's not come back home exactly in the sense of the palace but he has come back home in the sense of he has come back to the kingdom so the king's minister are like the devtas so krishna when the soul is not yet ready to serve krishna for whatever reason and krishna says okay if you can't serve me if you can't worship me you can't work for me then work for someone on my behalf someone who is connected with me and by that at least you will get elevated to some extent the king's minister these are the the god so these are the refer to the various gods so the gods are working on krishna's behalf they are administrators in krishna's system of administration and krishna has arranged for them also to not just be administrators but also to be receivers of worship as and when required now people worship so the worship of the devtas because they want some material needs we discussed in the previous session how there is fear desire duty love at various levels people worship people approach the divine so they uh, uh, they approach the divine and here also with similar motives fear desire uh, usually at a more preliminary level of motives fear desire uh, they approach for material benefits and at least what is happening is by worshiping the gods they are back in the vedic system they are worshiping and author- they are worshiping or serving an authorized representative and then gradually it may happen that they may think okay i'm worshiping these gods I, i'm uh, worshiping these gods that's, that's good but now do these gods worship someone quite often we see in the puranas and the itihasas whenever there is a great cosmic danger 
the gods also go to vishnu krishna go primarily go to vishnu in a later session we'll discuss about the difference between vishnu and krishna uh, or the similarity and the difference but here suffice it they go to vishnu so when they go to vishnu what happens oh that now they seek help from vishnu that means the people who are worshiping the gods think that maybe do the gods who i worship also have some overlord about them just like the person who is serving the king's minister may i wonder does this minister also have a boss if he comes to know there is a boss then he will start worship, uh, start wanting to work for their boss so that's how the person may eventually come to krishna or oh, that they are worshiping the gods and gradually to the internal system of progression that is there they will come to krishna now initially when they come to krishna also they may not come to krishna with any pure motive they are not just like the the son is not yet overcome whatever differences he had with the father but at least he thinks okay if my father gives me better terms for service why not i want i have to work somewhere why not why not work here itself so it's like worshiping krishna for mixed devotion is like a prince saying that i'll work for the king but i will not live with the king i'll not be a prince and i will not be a, a live in the home come back home but from mixed devotion so in the previous session we discussed how from mixed devotion one may eventually rise to pure devotion that happens by association that happens by purification um, that happens by gradual understanding of how krishna is not just the grantor krishna is not just the fulfiller of the uh, fulfiller of desires krishna is himself the fulfillment of our desires so this is a gradual progression so we see here that krishna's compassion is manifested through the gods through the devatas they don't stand in competition to him they stand in progression toward him now let's move forward so krishna himself sets up this system how krishna gives power to the gods and krishna gives faith to the worshipers of the gods so i talk i we talk about 721 so 721 22 and 23 in the bhagavad gita talk about this system of worship so yo yo yam yam tanum bhakta shraddhaya architum ichchati tasya tasya chalam shraddham tam eva vidham yaham so i give the unshaking faith achalam shraddham and i give that firm faith to people and that is important to understand that krishna gives faith to the worshippers of the gods so for example we may have a, especially if we are from a indian background uh, or if we have friends who are from that background we might see that they often worship various gods and they may have what seems like a deep or strong devotion and we need to know that that the worship that they are doing is not simply misconceived but it's also actually that faith is given by krishna sataya shraddhaya yuktas tasya aradhanam ihate labhate ch tatah kaman mayaiva vihitan hitan so the second line which i mentioned over here that is described in 721 that is the verse which we discussed which we recited at the start of the class and 722 describes what is given in the first line mayaiva vihitan hitan it is i who give these fruits mayaiva vihitan hitan so the, the devatas are given powers by krishna that means it is krishna who is actually setting up the whole system krishna gives power to the worshipers and krishna krishna gives faith to the worshipers krishna gives power to the gods what is the purpose of all this let the soul come at least some steps closer even if the soul doesn't come back home fully to krishna but let the soul come closer to him that is the purpose so here we see that krishna is selflessly compassionate that means what krishna wants is our elevation not his own glorification normally if somebody is say number 1 if somebody comes to a somebody is the ceo of office and they may want everyone to know i am the ceo but krishna is not like that is okay 
if suppose an important deal is to be done and the ceo somehow the opposing party has some animus against the ceo the ceo must say that you, know, you go and maybe tell the point somebody else that you be the you act as the primary liaison between us and the comp and that group and i give you full description the authorities for that purpose like power of attorney i give so the idea is that striking the deal is more important than whatever personal issues we may have among each other so like that krishna is not like a god who resides in heaven wants everyone to worship him and glorify him no even if you can't worship me you can still be elevated and i'll create systems for your elevation that is krishna's selfless compassion so actually for some people when they hear about how there are so many devatas talked about and they think this is very confusing whom do we worship uh, but if we actually understand the original intent then we will see that this is krishna's compassion that he is himself creating systems for having surrogates having substitutes for him why because it, because he simply wants the soul's elevation so this is another difference in the biblical tradition it is said krishna is a jeal uh, that god is jealous in fact one of the commandments is thou shall not worship any other gods mm. so that is krishna that is per perceived of god as a jealous being and often the relationship between god and the um, worshipers and the, uh, and those devoted is uh, talked about in a is like talked about in a monogamous matrimonial terms like god is like the husband and the worshipers are like the the worshiper is like the wife so if the if the worshiper worships some other god it is treated like the wife is being unfaithful and having a relationship with some other man so that in that context often within love within romantic relationships jealousy can be not only a sorrow of relationship but can also evoke vindictive emotions and people can go mad in passion related crimes so quite often the idea is that kind of fear and imagery associated with fear is created that if you worship any other god so in the same example in the old testament is talk people worship some other god and then all kinds of destructions came upon them storms came and famines came and invaders came and pillaged everything from them and he said all this was a result of your turning away from the true god and worshiping the false god that's how it's depicted over there so this is not the kind of system that is described in the vedic tradition so god is not jealous he is zealous zealous means he is with untiring zeal working for our elevation working for our elevation means that he doesn't consider or he doesn't worry whether it is i who am being worshiped or not it is whether the soul is being elevated or not that is the important thing so now here i'll address one point of confusion and this i'll spend some time on this to understand this point that when we say krishna gives faith to the worshipers of the gods now how does he give faith shri prabhupada writes in the translation of this verse that it is through the super soul in the heart and there is no mention there is no reference to the super soul in the heart in the verse itself prabhupada sometimes integrates uh, his purports into his translations also and now another way which madhvacharya mentions Mah uh, <clears throat> uh, in one of his books is that actually even the puranas which glorify the devatas they are also coming from vishnu all the puranas and the vedas come from ultimately from the breath of the sub divine it is said so now why do these puranas glorify vishnu uh, sorry glorify the particular devta so if we say for example read shiva puran it will from reading the shiva puran it will appear as if shiva is the supreme if we read some literature about ganesh it will appear as if the ganesh ganesh is supreme if we read um something about devi the goddess it will appear as if the goddess is supreme so now not all the all the literature about these devatas are necessarily authentic literatures just as we know that everything that is written about the gita or about the ramayana or the mahabharata is not necessarily authentic 
so we have to consider the traditional sources but even in authentic traditional sources we might find some places where the devtas are being glorified as if they are supreme so now what is the purpose of that so the purpose is actually to elevate the purpose is to simply uh, encourage people it's like if you want somebody to worship someone you tell them that actually this person is not supreme but you worship him well then the faith the inspiration to worship may not be there so much so the idea is if we want people to worship someone then they have to be inspired wholeheartedly and being inspired wholeheartedly one integral part of it is that they need to focus they need to recognize that this is an opportunity for that they need to, that this is what i need to focus on so for that purpose when the shiva purana talks about lord shiva then there is extensive glorification of lord shiva and conversely when there are other worshipers other forms of worship being talked about then there is extensive glorification of those particular devtas the purpose of this is to inspire faith so that there can be elevation and then is it a contradiction that say shiva puran treats almost shiva as if he is supreme and vishnu puran treats vishnu as if he is supreme well it's not a contradiction it's a paradox Par what does paradox mean paradox means it's a contradiction at the level of the surface but at a deeper understanding the contradiction is resolved and that's how we can move forward in terms of uh we can move forward in terms of understanding who uh, that worship that so the sorry the paradox can be resolved by getting underlying understanding so one example i have given of something which seems contradictory say in academics it is said the least corrected papers are the most correct now it's a least correct most correct what is going on over here the least corrected papers means that if a if on a paper that is being assessed by a teacher there are not many red marks then that means that actually uh, the paper is already very correct and that's why the number of red marks required was very less so similarly the least corrected papers are the most correct so like that this is a contra this seems to be like a contradiction but it's a paradox so like that what is the paradox over here when the devtas are being glorified almost as if they are supreme the idea is the purpose or the purpose is that purpose is that it is ultimately the super, there is one common purpose for the soul's elevation and there are some kind of specific glorifications that are reserved for vishnu alone now succinctly to describe vishnu and krishna are the same person the difference is primarily in mood vishnu is more like god in office and krishna is more like god at home especially vishnu in the role of cosmic administrator is like god in office and krishna in vrindavan is like god at home but they are one and the same person just in different moods so the idea is that there are worshipers of the gods and that is meant ultimately for elevating people so gradually so i'm mentioning that there are some particular forms of glorification that are reserved for vishnu vishnu krishna and they are not used for other devtas so for example the bhagavat puran says vaishnavanam yatha shambhu now shiv puran never says that shaivanam yatha vishnu that um, vaishnavanam yatha shambhu means that among all the great devotees of vishnu shiva is considered to be among the greatest now the, there's no parallel statement like among all the worshipers of shiva vishnu is the supreme now Vish, shiva is glorified as vishwanath vishwanath means he is the he is the master of the universe now vishnu is glorified as ananta koti brahmand nayak and vishnu is glorified as not just the source of not just the master or the source of the creator of one universe but of countless universes so now we can go into the technicalities of the specifics of the glorification but here we are focusing on overall principles so i am not going to go into the 
technicalities the purpose of this class is not to try to prove how krishna is supreme and other gods are subordinate you know that is a debate which can go on forever and people can quote from various scriptures for the purposes for purpose for for, for, for trying to prove their own particular point uh, that is not our purpose here our purpose is to try to understand the principles of why there is a system of worship like this once we understand the purpose then the contradictory statements can be relatively is more easily uh, made sense of so here let's try to use another metaphor to understand now is the worship of the devtas good or bad mm. so Uh, it depends on where someone is at what level someone is so imagine if a father has two kids and one of them performs very well gets 80% marks usually in exams the other gets 40% and say so today both of them have come back with their uh, with the results and both of them have got 60% now for the son who had 40% and came to 60% the father will say bravo well done but for the son who has Who's eighty percent? Who is to get eighty percent? Has now got sixty percent. The father will say, "What have you done? What have you done?" So similarly, if we consider forty percent is the level of godless materialism, where a person doesn't worship any higher being at all, sixty percent is the worship is the level of worship of the devotees, which is like pious materialism, and eighty percent is like the worship of Krishna, even if it is for worldly purpose. That's mixed devotion. So now, if somebody is at the level of eighty percent, if they come down to sixty percent, then that's undesirable. That's like the student. So, so somebody is worshiping Krishna. If they start worshiping the devotees, that is undesirable. Now, Krishna is speaking the Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna, who is already a devotee of Krishna, and thus Krishna says that Alpa Medha Sam, those who worship the devotees, their intelligence is not fully evolved. Now, Krishna is saying that Alpa Medha Sam, their intelligence is meager. because they are captivated by a particular fruits that they might get and they don't understand the overall system of worship in contrast those who worship uh, those who are not worshiping anything at all they are godless for them if they start worshiping the devta that's a step up up for them so it's pious materialism it's a step up so from 40% to 60% is a step up from 80% to 60% is a step down and of course beyond that we have the 100% where there is pure devotion sorry this top one is something has not been saved over here this worship of krishna is pure devotion so now With this understanding that so although Krishna says that the worship of the devotees is for less intelligent, but Krishna himself through the Vedas has created the system. So that's why we we needn't have a patronizing attitude toward others, those who worship the devotees. Now, first let's look at two things. Now, first we look at how the system has worked historically in the cases of some great souls, and how we can play our part in making the system work when we encounter people who worship the devotees. so there is a story uh, in the vallabha bhakti tradition vallabha acharya was a, a, a great saint who lived especially in the who lived in the gujarat rajasthan area in india and he worshiped shiva nansi was very distressed because of certain things in his life and he fervently worshiped shiva and asked for when shiva appeared in front of him he asked shiva you know give me what is more, what is dearest to you Not many people would have asked, "Give me wealth, give me this, give me that," but he asked, "Give me that which is dearest to you." And when he was asked this, he naturally gave him a, a deity of Krishna to worship. So Shiva revealed that what was dearest to him was Krishna. And as Vallabha Acharya later on, even when he became a great Acharya, Vishnu Acharya, he also often respectfully refers to Shiva as one of his, as a prominent teacher for him. is another great vaishnav poet that is chandidas and chandidas was uh, as an chandi is another name for the goddess there are various names for the goddess there is durga there is kali 
the various names that of sometimes based on the different moods in which the goddess is being worshipped. But the idea is that basically Chandi is one of the names of the goddess, and Chandi Das refers to one who is a servant of the goddess. So Chandi Das was was a person who worshipped Chandi quite devotedly. And what happened? He is considered to be such a great poet that even Chaitanya Charitamru described that Lord Chaitanya, who was himself greatly devoted to Krishna, who manifested extraordinary devotion to Krishna, used to hear the poetic composition of Chandidas. So what was going on here? So what had happened was Chandidas had a brother who was a Vaishnava. And his brother was quite poor. Whereas Chandidas himself was quite well to do. And he had a big garden in which he had some flowers which were growing. And his brother asked him, Can I just take one flower for of worshipping my Shaligram Shila? Shaligram Shila is a is a stone image of that uh, of Vishnu. It's uh so he said, his brother said, so Chandidas said, Absolutely not. Every single flower in my garden is meant for the worship of Chandi alone. So his brother Agree, uh, brother was sad, but he didn't insist. And one morning, and his brother returned from his early morning ablutions and was about to start worshipping the um, worshipping uh, his Shaligram Sila. He looked across the garden, looked across to his brother's garden and saw a Chandi, Chandidas garden and saw that there was a beautiful flower. So in his mind, he thought, hey, This flower is so beautiful, let me offer it to my God, Shaligram Sila. In the mind, it would be so nice if I could offer this to him. So he off bid the offering in the mind. And the result of that was after that when Chandidas was worshipping Chandi and he used the same flower to worship her and he asked and as he was worshipping Chandi immediately came in front of him. He says, I am pleased with your worship. What do you want? He says, he was delighted. He was thrilled to have Chandi appear in front of him. He says, what, what? you know, I am grateful that you have come here. And but before I ask you for anything, please tell me how is it that I have been worshipping you for so many years? Why is it that you are pleased today? He said, Today you have offered me the prasad of Vishnu. He says, What do you mean? Then she told what had happened. How her brother had mentally offered the flower to Vishnu. Now there is a form of worship of Vishnu which is called Manas Puja, where if we can't do a service physically, we can at least do it in the mind. That's Manas Puja. So what happened over there? And she worshipped in this way. Then she, she said, I have got the prasad of my Lord. So then Chandidas asked, hey, does that mean worshipping Vishnu is better than worshipping you? He says, of course. He says, Vishnu is not just my master. He's the master of my master. Says, what do you mean? He says, my Lord is Shiva. Shiva and the goddess are often considered to be a uh, couple. So she says, My Lord is Shiva, and He is the Lord of Shiva. Shiva is often show, see, depicted as having meditation beads in his hands. So once Parati asked him, You know, there are so many people who across the world who chant Om Namah Shiva, but whose names do you chant? So he says, Rama, Rama, Rame, Ti, Rame, Rame, Mano, Rame, Sahasranam, Tatulyam, Rama, Nama, Varanane. So Rama Rama Ram Iti. So he says, I am chanting the names of Ram. So Ram, of course, another manifestation of uh, Vishnu Krishna only. So the idea here is that the uh, when Chandidas understood that worshipping Krishna is better than worshipping uh, Chandi, then he became a great devotee of Krishna over a period of time and wrote extraordinary poetry glorifying Krishna. And he was considered such a great poet that his poetry became widely celebrated and even Lord Chaitanya heard it. Now, the significant point of this story is not just that Chandi Das was worshipping Chandi and became a worshipper of Krishna. It was also that Chandi Das did not reject Chandi. He still respected Chandi as um, as the teacher who guided him to Krishna, and as he kept the name Chandi Das, he did not reject the name Chandi Das and acquire and assume a name like Krishna Das. So, but the idea, this is how the progression works. Somebody comes to the gods if they come with a sincere desire, 
or circumstantially uh, some kind of blessings manifest then they can rise to the worship of krishna so respect the gods and respectfully play your part in krishna's plan for those who worship the gods so here uh, so how we can make the progression work is so suppose we have some acquaintances who worship the devtas worship the gods then we need first of all how do we approach it we need to recognize that we have to worship respect the gods uh, so if we pass by a temple of a devta we can offer our respects over there the we don't have to respect them as the supreme but we can respect them as <clears throat> as great souls who are, who can also bless us so that we can worship the supreme better we have the example of the gopis who are considered topmost devotees they worship katyayani who is a form of the goddess so that they can get devotion to krishna they can they, are, they can attain krishna rather so the idea is the gods are beings who are much more powerful than us in the cosmic hierarchy we exist at the terrestrial level the earthly level then there is a the celestial level where the gods exist and then there is a the transcendental level where there is where krishna exists i'll talk about the structure of the cosmos when we discuss the eighth chapter but suffice it to say that there are the gods exist at a higher level than us and they need to be respected and to there is we we need to respect them so quite often uh, we may respect the gods but we may disrespect the worshipers of the gods we may only take one part of it and say that oh these are uh, krishna says in the gita that those who worship the gods are unintelligent are less intelligent alpamedasa that is one part of the story but other part is that they are better than the vast majority of people who may not worship anyone at all they might just be godless materialists so we have to see that if somebody is worshiping a particular devta then it is krishna who is in their hearts and krishna is guiding them krishna has a plan for their journey and we can play our part in that plan so sometimes we often have i talked earlier about the abrahamic religions which had the idea of a true god and the false god and they were quite intolerant toward the idea of any false gods being worshiped and they would destroy the false gods so as devotees uh, we may not have we, we will not be intolerant toward the gods but we are often quite intolerant toward the worshipers of the gods so that same mood of abrahamic intolerance see what happened was for our movement started in america and many of shri prabhupada's early disciples but people who came from the abrahamic faiths and they often so the, they 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 grew up with the idea of one true god and false gods so when I mean, they came and encountered the system of the various gods they were often quite intolerant the prabhupada told we should worship the respect the gods so they would respect the gods but often the worshipers of the gods they were quite demeaned and condemned and we might carry that abrahamic intolerant mentality not towards the worshipable gods but at least the worshipers of the gods you have to understand that people can be at their level quite elevated in the system of the in the somebody might be very devoted to shiva or to durga or to ganesh or whatever and their devotion in that direction needs to be respected so now if we can give a proper philosophical understanding by which they can come gradually towards the worship of krishna that is excellent but if we can't we don't have to condemn them so, so they are at i talked about 40% and 60% they are at 60% now if we can get them from 60% to 80% that's excellent but if we can't then if we just insist no we quote from this scripture and they quote from that book and we quote here and they quote there and in the end they say hey, this is so confusing better i don't want to do anything with this business only with this god business and then they become materialistic and atheistic and what have we done we haven't we have actually done disservice to them 
that we have got instead of getting them from the 60% to 80%, we have pushed them down from 60% to 40%. So we needn't be intolerant. We try to present philosophically as well as we can. And if they understand, that's good. If they don't, if they don't understand, they don't accept. We understand that Krishna has a plan for them. And they may need to evolve more before they can come to the level of worshipping Krishna. Just like the, the son who has been estranged from the father, if he has come back to the kingdom, that is good. That's one step forward. Now, if, if the king, if the prince before he is ready is brought back to the home, and then there might be so much resentment that the prince might just leave the kingdom and go away. So we don't have to be that forceful that we end up being counterproductive. So our purpose is ultimately we don't disrupt people's faith, but we elevate their faith as much as is possible for us. And by that way, we understand this prof profound system of worship. And just as Krishna is zealous, similarly, we can also be zealous, not just in pushing people, but in expertly helping people rise to a higher level of consciousness. So to summarize, I spoke today about uh, the system of worship of the Devtas, talked about three points in it. First is understanding the system of polymorphic monotheism. So traditionally, in the, as per Western thought, there was monotheism, which was the Abrahamic religions. And prior to the Abrahamic religions, the Greco-Roman tradition endorsed what was thought of as polytheism. So the Vedic system doesn't fit into any of these two neat categories. It's more of polymorphic monotheism. And there's one divine, one divinity who manifests in many forms, at many levels, through many persons. And then within that, we discussed further about um, the difference between this polymorphic, this conception or the Vedic conception of the gods is, it's not one true god versus many false gods, but there is one supreme god and many subordinate gods. And to understand the system of progression, how it reflects compassion, we talked about the prodigal son's metaphor, prodigal son's story. So the, in the Abrahamic tradition, the father waits for the son to come back and that indicates the father's love. In the Vedic tradition, Krishna doesn't, doesn't just wait, but works. How works? By sending his own representatives. So if the, the prince is not ready to come back to the king, then at least let the prince start working with the king's representative minister. So Krishna gives faith to the worship of the Devata, worshippers of the devtas and Krishna gives power to the devtas and as Krishna sets up the whole system. Then I talked about how Krishna is in, how within the system, how does the progress, Krishna is not jealous, he is zealous. Krishna is selflessly compassionate. He doesn't want his own glorification, he wants the soul's elevation primarily. And I talked about, is the system of worship good or bad? Krishna does say it's Alpa Medhasa, it's for those who, are, the, the, those who worship the Devatas are less intelligent. But then Krishna also says, Krishna himself has created the system through the Vedic scriptures. So it depends on the level of a person. If somebody is 40% a student, that's like a materialistic person. 60% is the worship of the gods, 80% is the worship of Krishna, and 100% is the worship of Krishna with pure devotion. It's like the prince comes back home out of love. At least the prince come back to the king to worship or uh, to serve to get some money. That's like mixed devotion. And then I talked about historically how this progression has worked with Vallabhacharya and Chandidas. And for us to make it work, we need to respect the gods and we need to respect those who respect those respect those who uh, worship the gods also and respectfully play our part in their elevation. Don't disrupt their faith, but elevate their faith as much as is possible for us. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. So, are there any questions? So, why did why did Krishna allow the system of the worship of the various gods? Uh, only the four sampradayas have to be, should have been allowed. Mm. Doesn't the, having so many gods and the scriptures about them create confusion? 
well if confusion is to be created even the four sampradayas also there is enough confusion if you read the history of of even of vaishnavism in it is said in in the writings of madhvacharya that madhvacharya refuted various pre previous teachers who had taught something which was incorrect and among the teachers that he has refuted it is said that he refutes ramanujacharya also so sectarianism can arise a sectarianism doesn't require a sectarian ideology it requires a sectarian mentality sectarian ideology means some books are teaching some sectarianism so mentality is the mind so the human mind has its own weakness vulnerability to sectarianism and anything can cause sect uh, that the sectarian mind will take up any pretext for sectarianism now if say tomorrow we all woke up and everything that divided us was removed say america is now in turmoil because of racial injustice as it is perceived so or uh, systemic injustice specifically specific, specific systemic racism so say tomorrow if all of america woke up with everybody of the same skin color but by tomorrow afternoon you know there would be some other reason found for this, for quarreling so we would create some differences for quarreling in christianity they accept uh, everybody accepts jesus as a savior and yet there are said to be almost like 55000 protestant groups and there are many orders within uh, catholicism also so sectarian division and the justification for that sectarian division that can come from any sources we understand why krishna has created the system that is you know when the prince is going to follow the minister the prince needs to be convinced that minister is powerful enough to reward me to give me a good deal if i respect him if i serve him so that's the purpose so if somebody is to worship the devtas they need to be convinced of the potency of the devtas and the worshipper of the scriptures uh, are given that conviction worshippers of the devtas are given that conviction to the corresponding scriptures so any system however perfect can lead to confusion because of the sectarian nature of the human mind itself because sectarianism is one of the we could say viruses of the human mind and just by removing external arrangements it's not the sectarianism will go away we understand krishna's purpose is compassionate and yes that confusion has resulted from it that's an unfortunate result because of the human mentality and as the as people become purified as they come to the mode of goodness then that kind of sectarianism can be overcome so that's the first question now well the second question is similar why we asked you not write one scripture why did we ask they write just one scripture not write one scripture so i wouldn't say that it's only one scripture as i said that this whole idea that there should be only one scripture is a you know we are trying to simplify reality reality itself is complex the human mind is complex that um, there are various shades of gray within black and white and the hope that everything should be black and white that is itself a naive understanding to some extent as finite fallible beings we need to learn to live with without absolute certainty now in which area of life do we have absolute certainty so if we are sick say now the corona pandemic is going on tomorrow if a vaccine is vaccine comes up now are we going to be sure that that vaccine is going to work for everyone in no area of life do we have absolute certainty and we understand that the vedic system is created so that there are people who are of different levels see the abrahamic understanding is 10 and we have acquired that abrahamic understanding also this is right and this is wrong reality does not operate based on digital logic it's more of analog logic and the attempt to reduce reality to digital logic is often the cause of great confusion so we need to understand that life is there are multiple levels people are of different consciousness 
so the idea is that if somebody is not able to worship krishna now for us we can say it's confusing but for others it might be facilitating those who can't worship krishna what happens to them are they meant to go to hell that's the idea in the abrahamic tradition that if you don't accept jesus as your savior you're going to go to hell so but that is not the vedic understanding the vedic understanding is much more accommodating so rather than trying to rather than asking why reality cannot be reduced so that it can fit into our framework of digital logic of right and wrong we need to expand our intelligence to understand how broad and magnificent the reality is so yes confusion can result because some things are complex but reality is complex and therefore the systems for elevating people in reality need to be sufficiently complex okay so now i'll talk about the difference between 7th and 9th chapters when we come to the 9th chapter well regarding how we approach lord shiva as devotees if we have some family who worship lord shiva or some extended family or some friends then if it is a part of a social convention if we have to participate in some systems of worship like that we can work in some festivals of lord shiva we can we can participate generally devotees themselves may not go out and participate in those kind of festivals but if it is required bhakti ro thakur says in chaitan shiksha amrut that a devotee is the devotee may participate in three kinds of festivals first is that the festivals is related with lord vishnu krishna are the festivals where the devotee's heart is mostly situated so they when they get um, elevated so now so he says that that this is the festivals where the devotee's heart is but suppose there are other festivals like the worship of the devtas during bhakti no thakur time there would be uh, the worship of the goddess kali or durga puja so he said out of social convention if somebody has to participate we can participate in those festivals in our hearts we can remember that these devtas are worshipers are ultimately devotees of the lord and we can pray to them for enhancing our devotion and uh, third thing is if there are some like some local cultural festival like say independence day or whatever a devotee may participate in those also out of deference to social convention so we can respect lord shiva as a great devotee and as a extremely powerful person who can also help us in our spiritual journey so now those who say for example those in south india they follow the mahapari of sringeri saradambal temple they have their disciplic succession also so now in the next session i'll talk about worship of uh, uh, the impersonal manifestation of the divine but let me suffice it to say over here is that it is not at all easy to actually fit in people real living people within certain conceptual categories okay i missed some questions here so rather than trying to fit things into categories we should see categories as guides every person within a category is also individual you know if we just look at a cross section of christians their understanding of christianity is widely different even if you look at a cross section of devotees their understanding of bhakti is also not always the same so we need we we shouldn't try to simply simplistically reduce people into categories or oh, this person fits here this person fits here this person fits here we are we understand that there is categorization in terms of concepts but people are not reducible to concepts just like say if there is a if there's a war between two countries say if there was a there was a civil war in america but when slavery was to be abolished now it was not all the people in north were good and all the people in south were bad there sometimes family members were caught on two different sides and some were all out for war some were 
neutral about it some were trying their best to uh, bring about peaceful resolution so just as politically the reality was the north and south were at war but at a personal level it is not that everybody had the same mentality so like that we have to understand that people are individuals and people cannot be reduced to a one category based on their affiliation with a particular group because the group might have a particular ideology but does that mean that every single person in that group adheres to that say, exact ideology in the exact same way no people are individuals so rather than trying to simplistically place people in certain categories we need to approach people as human beings as persons and see how best we can help them in their spiritual journey okay so when it is said in other religions that if you don't worship god you are going to go to hell why is this given when the goal of all religions is ultimately to attain love of god i think i explained this in my 4.11 class that you know when there is some exclusivist understanding that also has a purpose and the purpose is to encourage people to focus just like if a patient who has gone to a dozen doctors and has not been able to commit to any one doctor he goes to a 13th doctor i goes to the next doctor and this doctor says that and this doctor says okay this is your diagnosis and this is the treatment but the patient starts saying that now but doctor i went to this that doctor and he said that and i went to that doctor and she said that and i went to that doctor and that doctor said that this doctor will say you just forget everything else that everyone has said just do what i am telling you and you'll get healed now when this doctor says to the patient just forget everything else that you have heard that is not meant to be a rejection of all the other doctors or the condemnation of all the other doctors it is created more for focus rather than for a categorical rejection for a specific focus just so if we look at the statements in abrahamic religions in a broader context the statements which seem to be that if you don't follow this you're going to go to hell they are they we understand that they are created for they are given for creating focus so but sometimes based on the sectarian nature of the followers they might over emphasize certain statements and that's how the prevailing ideology might become that if you don't worship this you worship this particular manifestation of the divine then you are going to go to hell so that's how it is to be understood over there now this idea pan pantheism panentheism henotheism i'll talk about in the next class so is somebody who worships krishna intrinsically or automatically higher than somebody who worships uh, or the devtas sometimes some the krishna worshiper might be only worshiping very occasionally and they might be still doing lots of materialistic activities whereas the worshiper of the devta might have been worshiping for generations and they worship with great sincerity yes that's why i said reality is nuanced and now conceptually is it possible that somebody might worship even the devta with respect to pure with with pure devotion yes it's possible in the south india and the, the tradition of uh, alwars who were considered great devotees of uh, vishnu and then the nayanwars were considered great devotees of shiva and if you write read their compositions they are also filled with pure devotional emotions so we understand that the ways of god and how he works are mysterious in our own lives when something happens you know we understand that even the law of karma is gahana karmano gati so and karma is about the material world and how the material world works so what to speak of how the path from the material world to the spiritual world works we can't expect that everything can be understood by us so we have to recognize one of the fundamental virtues in spiritual and the spiritual journey is humility and humility means to understand that we can never understand krishna's plan fully 
Humility means to understand that we can never understand Krishna's plan fully. So how Krishna plans for the elevation of which soul is something which may be well beyond our comprehension. Uh, and we focus on our elevation and we follow a path that helps us to get elevated. And we try to get as much a sense of reality as possible. In every area, as we start going closer and closer or deeper and deeper, we start seeing so many shades of gray. Like <clears throat> I just mentioned about the same North America and South, no, Northern part of America and Southern part of America during the Civil War. Now, if you look at, uh, <clears throat> say, for example, the Second World War. Second World War, often Nazi Germany is portrayed as villainous. And that's, that's true, they had the Holocaust. But if you see from another perspective, that Britain itself induced a lot of famine in India. And what Britain did for India during the Second World War, so that they could have supplies for their own stocks and the invading Japanese army wouldn't have, that is also bad. It is also, it, it is said to have the Bengal famine at that time caused several millions of deaths. And la a large part of it was, was induced by governmental policy. Now, that was nowhere as bad or as intentional directly as, say, the Holocaust. But still, the point is that the British leaders were also quite brutal. So when we, if we say, okay, these allied, Axis powers were bad and Allied powers were good, well, in some sense, it's true. But in some senses, it's not true also. So the point I'm making is, in any area of life, we start with black and white. And black and white is essential as a basic mental map. If we start with shades of gray, then we will never get any understanding at all. Because every, all the shades of gray will seem similar. And we will not get any differentiation at all. So we need, to, we need to have some understanding of black and white. But we also need to understand that black and white doesn't define all of reality. So um, whenever we have any conceptual tools for analyzing, mm, if the, let's uh, let's talk about the Mahabharat itself. Krishna here speaks the Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna, and that same Arjuna is also fixed is also there in the Mahabharat. Is is one of the primary characters of the Mahabharat, and in the Mahabharat there are so many incidents in the forests when the Pandavas are there. They meet sages of different backgrounds. So the sages are of different backgrounds and the Pandavas interact with all of them respectfully. The Pandavas are themselves Vaishnavas, but they meet Shaiva saints also. In fact, the same Mahabharat in which there's a Vishnu Sahasranam, there is also a Shiva Sahasranam. A thousand names of Shiva are also there. And we see that Arjuna also worships various gods so that he can get certain weapons by which he can fight the war for Krishna's sake. So the idea is that if you look at the Mahabharata, the reality is much more nuanced. The Pandavas were fixed in their own worship of Krishna Vishnu, but that doesn't mean that they rejected or condemned other forms of worship. So the idea here is that we all have to look at individual consciousness of people. And based on individual consciousness, some people are so, so it could be conceivably possible that the worshippers of the devtas sometimes may be at a higher level of consciousness than the worshippers of Krishna. Uh, so I was going to mention this metaphor, explain this metaphor in the next class, but I'll mention it right now. And then we'll elaborate in the next session. So the idea is, say imagine that there's a huge skyscraper and we have to go up the skyscraper. It's a hundred level skyscraper. And some and there's one sky, one elevator which goes only up to the 50th level. And the other level elevator goes up to the hundredth level. So now somebody might be in the elevator which is up to which are, where they have gone up to level 49. And we might be in the elevator which goes to the level hundred, but we are at level one. So now who is who is better? Well, in terms of the altitude, the person who's at the level 49 is at a higher altitude. However, once they come to level 50, they will have to come out of the elevator. They have to find out another path 
they may think that oh this 50 is the highest level or they may have to they come out and maybe there's something higher then they come out and they have to find some other elevator and then they take that elevator up and they go to the level of 100 gradually so the person who's at level one is at a lower level definitely from objective perspective as compared to level 49 but they are better situated that means if they just stay 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 in that elevator they can go right up to the level 100 so similarly so the the elevator that goes up to level 50 is like a person who is worshiping the devtas the devtas themselves are not eternal and that's why worshiping the devtas cannot take one to the eternal spiritual world so it's like an elevator that takes us to level 50. so if somebody is at the level 49 yes i mean i have i have met people who are intensely devoted to the devtas and their devotion is often at least when i had met them 10 15 years ago i can say their devotion for devta is much more than my devotion whatever little devotion i have for krishna so i've seen that and it's true so they are at a higher level and if their devotion is higher their their lives are purer or they're more sincere in some ways then we appreciate that so it's not that somebody who just occasionally worships krishna is automatically at a higher level it is they are better situated to go to a higher level but that doesn't mean automatically they are at a higher level okay so thank you very much for your thoughtful questions shrimad bhagavad gita ki jai Hare Krishna.